From the Colosseum to the ancient Forum, Rome is known for its beautiful relics from a lost empire. Among the ruins of columns and statues, one can still see the influence of Rome's first emperor, Augustus. Augustus ruled for 44 years, and his reign began an era of peace and prosperity known as the Pax Romana, or Roman peace. When Augustus came to power, he was 19 years old and still known as Octavian. It was 44 BC, a time of civil strife in Rome. Octavian's great uncle, Julius Caesar, was murdered by members of the Roman Senate who opposed his attempts to reform the government. Taking command of Caesar's army, Octavian joined forces with Caesar's chief general, Mark Antony, and together their armies hunted down Caesar's assassins. Octavian and Antony shared power in Rome, but soon quarreled. At the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, Octavian defeated Antony and his powerful ally, Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. In 27 BC, as a reward for his victory, the Senate gave Octavian the name Augustus, Exalted One, and the title of Princeps, or First Citizen. With time, the importance of the Senate decreased. Augustus not only brought an end to the era of the Republic, he achieved Caesar's dreams of government reform. According to the historian Suetonius, Augustus said his goal was to establish a stable government. May it be my privilege to have the happiness of establishing the Commonwealth on a firm and stable basis, but only if I may be called the architect of the best possible government, and bear with me the hope when I die that the foundations which I have laid for its future government will stand firm and stable. To govern more efficiently, Augustus created a civil service to enforce the laws. He also encouraged outlying provinces to rule by self-government, freeing his armies to conquer more land and expand the empire. To help the economy and make the tax system fairer, Augustus ordered a census or population count to gain an accurate sense of who was taxed. Four times I came to the assistance of the treasury with my own money, Augustus said. Under Augustus, writers such as Livy and Tacitus produced their histories of Rome. The poet Virgil wrote the Aeneid, an epic poem that describes the founding of Rome. Artists and sculptors created beautiful mosaics and lifelike statues. Craftsmen and architects erected palaces, temples and large public amphitheaters and improved entertainment venues such as the Circus Maximus. Noting his accomplishments during the Pax Romana, Augustus wrote, I found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. Of course, a little video there, of course, on uh, Emperor Augustus, of course, who ruled the first Roman emperor that they had, of course. So anyway, I want to welcome you back, of course, to History 1113. It's Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. I hope everybody had a great spring break. Uh, it's kind of a long kind of a break for us. So it must be like almost 10 days or whatever it is. So, yeah, back on the air here, uh, of course. So, uh, anyway, so everybody had a great, great break. Uh, you know, do have a lot of assignments. You know, you got upcoming, of course. I'll probably talk about the day, uh, of course. And I will, of course, continue talking about, of course, ancient Rome, which we'll talk about most of that this week. And then I think part of next week, I'll kind of wrap up that. Uh, before I kind of move on to the uh, Middle Ages, uh, which is kind of like the last period of really I'll kind of get to uh, for this class. So anyway, it looks like we do have a few students watching right now. It looks like Amber, who's in, looks like Australia, looks like it, I guess. Hey, what's going on? Glad to join us, of course, uh, this morning. Uh, Matthew, hey, good morning. Hope you're doing great uh, overall. Bye. Hey, good morning uh, also as well. Uh, Jillian, I hey, hope you're doing great also. Uh, and, of course, Drake's also right there watching as well. So everybody's doing a, having a great day. Uh, hopefully you got, a, you know, not too many weeks left. I think we have what, three weeks left, I think, of classes pretty much. Uh, and then, of course, we've got finals coming up, uh, you know, all that. So uh, anyway, before I get going, I did want to remind you about some assignments, of course, you've got coming up 
uh, that are due. Uh, the second exam is due, believe it or not, tonight. Uh, it's been up forever, I know, because they had the spring break uh, and all that. But that that's something you need to wrap up. Uh, I'll try to send out announcements about that today. Uh, that needs to be wrapped up, of course, and gotten done. Uh, also, I do have a new quiz I posted today, this morning, uh, which is on early Roman history. It mostly deals with the first two lectures and part of this lecture also as well, really up to the time of like Julius Caesar and all that. I think that's mostly what that's going to be for, uh, which probably won't be on the final later. But our final exam is going to be pretty much whatever it can cover in later, you know, at the end of the semester and all that. So whether we have any more quizzes, I don't know yet. We might have another quiz after that. But y'all do have like the book report, you know, come and do later in the week. Uh, I think starting Friday, uh, April the 16th. And then also you do have a third vocab uh, that's also due uh, around the same time as well. So so anyway, uh, like I said, today we will be talking about the rise of the Roman Empire. I'm mostly going to kind of start under the time of Julius Caesar, which we've kind of already started talking about him already uh, at this point. I'll talk about his grandnephew, Octavian. He, of course, comes into power, takes over, uh, and, of course, eventually ends up being the first Roman emperor, uh, but he's later known as Augustus, of course, same person, of course, we're talking about, of course, here. So if you have any questions, uh, like I said, you know, uh, during the live stream or also later, you know, you can send me any kind of comments, questions, uh, you know, on my channel, uh, like usual. Uh, so hopefully you send some kind of thing about that later. So Anyway, let's get started, of course, today. Uh, like I said, we're still talking about, um, I think, you know, pretty much Julius Caesar. I think the last thing we had talked about was we had, I think I know we were talking about the first triumvirate, uh, which we had, we had kind of gotten into before. You know, I think we had mentioned how Julius Caesar, Marcus Crassus, uh, Gnaeus Pompey, uh, those three kind of created this uh, dictatorship to control Rome. Uh, in 60 BC. Uh, they sometimes call it, by the way, the three-headed monster. <laughs> Some people call it that. Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, these three powerful men, I think we talked about. Uh, and um, I don't know if I went into it, but uh, Caesar, by the way, was the father-in-law of um, Pompey. Uh, he actually, Pompey married one of Julius Caesar's daughters. So it was kind of those two kind of a line through blood, I guess, sort of. Uh, and uh, both Caesar and Pompey were great generals. And I told you how Marcus Crassus was like really wealthy. He was like a billionaire for that time period, of course, uh, in Roman history. Now, I think I mentioned how what happened to Marcus Crassus. Crassus went to the east to fight the Parthian Empire. And what happened was he got killed in battle. I think about Carrie, I think it's called, uh, and he was killed in 53. Uh, and so anyway, that left two men left basically to fight it out. Uh, as you remember correctly, Caesar and Pompey are now these two rivals against each other. And so Caesar, you know, in January 49 BC, like I told you before, crossed the Rubicon, right, uh, into Italy. That sparked the so-called, you know, this huge civil war uh, that would break out later which they, you know, they call it different names, but commonly the, the common name they usually call it is uh, Caesar's Civil War. Uh, and of course, both sides fight to control, you know, this whole extensive territory you're looking at uh, in this map right here. Kind of blow that up right there. But uh, you can see uh, Caesar ends up conquering the majority of that, of the, of the Roman Republic. And I think I told you that Caesar was considered one of the greatest uh, conquerors and generals in Roman history, uh, more or less. Uh, and of course, they'll make they'll make Caesar, you know, a dictator. That's one of the things that happens, and kind of one of the, I think one of the things that leads to the downfall of the Republic and you know the rise of the empire. Of course, you know, ruled by emperors later. Uh, but first, what happened with Pompey? Uh, Pompey did not have enough forces really to really take on Caesar. Uh, in fact, Caesar's forces were crack troops because they had been fighting in Gaul, like in France, uh, conquering Gaul uh, for several years. So they were really good. Uh, Caesar was a better general, I think, than Pompey overall. Uh, and uh, so at Pompey, Pompey eventually fled. He actually fled Italy to Greece uh, to get reinforcements. 
And so that allows Caesar to basically start mopping up. He takes control of Italy. Uh, then he marches uh, to the um, western part of, um, of, of the Republic and takes over what is Spain. So I think there's a rebellion over here. So he takes that race across here to, I think, eventually take over Turkey and Syria eventually. And then finally, he does invade into um, what is Greece uh, to take on uh, Pompey's forces. Those two actually do fight it out eventually. Uh, and um, I think it's actually in the year 48 was the year. Yeah, 48 BC is when it was, August 48, uh, which was basically the Battle of Pharsalus. It's called, kind of, kind of takes place in the western part of Greece. Uh, and um, Pompey's forces were a lot better, like like larger size than, than uh, Caesar's forces. He had more troops, uh, but uh, Caesar's force were just, like, like I said, crack troops that had been fighting for a bunch of years. Uh, and then, of course, on top of that, you had a case where um, I think most of Pompey's force didn't really want to fight Caesar because they're kind of like all knew each other. Uh, and so most of Pompey's forces in the middle of battle, I think, just quit. And so they, they surrendered their forces and it ended up happening is Pompey eventually, uh, if you know about it, he fled to the Ptolemaic kingdom uh, in Egypt to try to get refuge uh, from the Egyptians, uh, from Julius Caesar's you know, forces. Uh, and uh, when he got there, he thought that they would do that. But what ends up happening, if you know about it, the, the ruler of, of Egypt, which is Ptolemy the 13th, who, by the way, was the uh, brother of Cle uh, Cleopatra, uh, would end up uh, sending assassins and killing him. So. So, yeah, uh, so Pompey ends up being murdered uh, by the Egyptians. Uh, and um, after that, Caesar would enter Egypt as one of the, the next things that would, of course, would happen. Uh, he would form an alliance with Cleopatra, uh, who, well, like I said, I told you, was the brother of the king of, of Ptolemaic Egypt, which was Ptolemy the 13th uh, at the time. Uh, you know, those two end up forming this alliance with each other. Uh, they also were lovers. I'll kind of get into that later. Uh, but uh, they end up having one son together, which is, uh, I think his name was Caesarian. Uh, they called him the only biological son, by the way, uh, that C Julius Caesar ever had. And um, it kind of provokes a civil war, like between Julius Caesar, Cleopatra versus Ptolemy XIII. Uh, and he ends up getting killed in the war. Uh, and then from there, uh, what ended up happening was Cleopatra would kind of take over basically Egypt. And she would rule down to close to about almost 30, 31 BC, uh, roughly. So, so yeah, Cleopatra is kind of a, another issue, of course, we'll get to later. She kind of does help to kind of also cause the downfall of the Republic, uh, especially when she gets into that relationship with Mark Antony, which by the way was considered one of the greatest love affairs probably of the of that period ancient history so yeah so you got that going on uh, at that point now caesar by the way would go on to conquer the rest of the republic pretty much i think parts of africa is also taken to north africa by jewish caesar uh, and uh, caesar made the famous remark by the way he wrote this letter to the roman senate where he said veni vidi vici uh, which meant i came i saw i conquered uh, and so he talked about how uh, his his battles were really easy compared to, I guess, his battles maybe that in Gaul. I think Gaul was harder probably fighting there. It took longer uh, to take Gaul than basically defeating Pompey's forces and allies. And so with that, he's able to eventually take over most of the Republic. And eventually what's going to end up happening is Julius Caesar is declared dictator of Rome, uh, which I think at first, if you know about it, he's declared uh uh, dictator for like 10 years. Uh, this is in the year 45 BC. Uh, and then in 44 BC, like early 44 BC, uh, he's basically given uh, the title for life as dictator of Rome. Uh, and so, and of course, that video talked about all the fact that, you know, Caesar also and his, you know, nephew Octavian will later start to kind of start making reforms to Rome. Uh, Caesar's biggest thing he did. Uh, that's famous, I guess, his legacy that you know today, uh, is he was one of the first to kind of push the idea of a, a leap calendar, uh, which 
they think originate with the Egyptians. Uh, and so he's wanted to develop the Julian calendar. And so for many, many years, like in parts of Europe and I guess the Mediterranean world, that's the main kind of calendar that they start using more or less. Later replaced by the Gregorian one, which is kind of similar to it uh, also as well. So yeah, that's kind of like the, you know, the thing with Julius Caesar uh, at that point. Now, what's going to happen next, of course, you know, because the fact that, you know, Julius Caesar's becoming, you know, so powerful, you know, because of the fact that he's now seen as this dictator, well, the senators, like in the Roman Senate, uh, believe that Caesar's trying to kind of re, re, you know, do the whole monarchy they had before, uh, where, you know, back in the time of, you know, going back to Romulus and all that, uh, they believe that he's trying to restore the traditional monarchy. Uh, and so they think that Caesar's going to become a king. Uh, and so basically you get this ring of senators uh, that start calling themselves the liberators, is what they were called. Uh, and uh, the liberators um, were like a kind of a ring of senators. Uh, they were supporters of Pompey. Uh, some of them were also friends of Julius Caesar. Uh, and... Um, Hey, Chris. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, so basically um, they, they conspired to kill it uh, and uh, to hopefully, you know, save the traditional Roman Republic uh, before. And uh, so it led to, you know, the Ides of March, they call it, you know, with, where Caesar's murdered, you know, assassinated, uh, the so-called famous date of March 15th, 44 B.C., uh, and uh, it did not take place, you know, in the Roman Senate. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know much about the Romans, like the senators, but sometimes they would meet uh, in like a theater. Uh, there's one, of the, of course, they had this called the so-called Theater of Pompey. They would meet there sometimes. And uh, anyway, uh, apparently uh, as Caesar was on his way there, uh, I think he was in the annex, I think, going into the uh, theater, a uh, group of senators approached him. Uh, I think to, to look at a petition or something at first. And also they started grabbing him, you know, and stabbing him. Uh, and uh, he was stabbed something like 23 times, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, in the struggle. Uh, there are several conspirators that were kind of involved that stabbed him. The two most famous, you know, were Gaius Cassius Longinus. I heard of him. And, of course, the most famous was Marcus Brutus, uh, who was believed to be one of, you know, Julius Caesar's good friends. Some people claim he was even an illegitimate son you know, through one of his mistresses, which that's never been claimed. Uh, but uh, they, they say that he was stabbed, like I said, that many times, but they think only like the last one, maybe my Marcus Brutus was actually fatal, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and so uh, eventually he could have gotten away, but they say, I think the story was, is that I think when he got stabbed, that he got blood in his eye, and his eye he couldn't see, so he fell down. Um, and so he then ended up dying on the floor there. Uh, so uh, the death of Caesar was really a turning point, you know, in Roman history. It, it pretty much leads to the end of the traditional republic because what's going to end, end up happening, you're going to have more civil wars uh, that break out afterwards. Like, yeah, they talked about that, the Civil War of the Liberators. I think they talked about that, that short video, how Octavian, later called Augustus, would help to of course, destroy that. Uh, and um, yeah, Caesar's death sparked a lot of riots. They practically burned the city down uh, after they killed their savior. You know, a lot of the plebes, the plebeians, you know, thought Caesar was their great hero, uh, you know, and all that. And a lot of the mobs chased him out. They attacked their their, their, their manors or whatever, their, their estates. Uh, and so, uh, it really, it really, like I said, it leads to the end of the Republic and the Republic was never the same after that. It never recovered. Uh, and it becomes more of the empire later with the emperor. You all see like the idea of Julius. Julius Caesar was not the first, you know, emperor, that kind of deal, but he was the prototype really that led to it. And even later, you know, they start calling the emperor Caesars, you know, named after him, of course. Now, of course, one of the things I'm going to get into next, we're going to talk about uh, the rise of Octavian, who's going to come in next, of course, which that little video was about, you know, they call Augustus, same person, of course, which was a title that was given to him later uh, by the Roman Senate. Uh, so you get this uh, grand nephew of Julius Caesar that comes in afterwards. 
after Caesar's killed. Uh, and um, he was actually a uh, like a nephew through one of like um, his sisters, like right through her, basically. And um, uh, Caesar didn't really have a legitimate son. Uh, and so what happened, Caesar had in his will adopted Octavian as his own son, which a lot of Romans would do. Uh, and so Octavian, he was like, I want to say like a teenager still, 18 or 19, I think it was, came to Rome uh, to claim his inheritance uh, and also, of course, take power, obviously, because it's his father now. Uh, and so uh, he would uh, actually form an alliance with these two other men, uh, which were Mark Antony and, of course, Marcus Lepidus, who I do have a picture of right here. And uh, they, they, of course, would form this alliance, which would later be called the so-called Second Triumvirate. You see there is what they usually call it, which was actually an official name. Uh, that was kind of used. And um, so, yeah, these these men that form, and it's like another dictatorship again, another three-headed monster, if you want to call it, uh, that'll kind of be around for about six, seven years uh, that they'll be in power. And part of why it formed, by the way, uh, was to go after the enemies of Julius Caesar, the so-called liberators, which they hunted down, by the way, uh, between 43 to 42 B.C., most of them either were either killed or some of them even killed themselves. I think some of the liberators that didn't want to be captured uh, by them. And a um, little bit about those two men, by the way, on the right uh, of Octavian. He's also called Octavius. They call him different names, by the way. But um, yeah, Marcus Lepidus was one of uh, Octavian's best generals. Uh, and then he had Mark, Mark Antony or Marcus Antonius uh, was, of course, the head of the like, cavalry predominantly under under actually under Julius Caesar before, but um, so those, those are in, I think they say Mark Antony was actually related uh, somehow to Julius Caesar, like, like I want to say a distant cousin. And, but he was also really good friends with, with Julius Caesar. In fact, act, uh, Antony was the one that gave the eulogy, uh, Julius Caesar's funeral uh, right afterwards. Now uh, what happened, uh, if you know about what occurred uh was that um, Lepidus was after so many years forced out. I think he was the weaker of the three. Uh, and um, so he would end up like those two, be, that, that, that guy getting pushed out, I think in exile. And then what happened was Octavian and Antony eventually formed this alliance with each other, like a dual dictatorship. Instead of three, you got two men you know, controlling Rome at that point. Uh, and uh, how they divide up the empire uh, is that uh, basically uh, Octavian would get the western half of basically uh, the, the, of the Roman Republic, and then the other half, Antony would get the eastern half, is what it would be. Uh, and um, of course, there was this deal where, if you know about this, uh, the two actually intermarried uh, by Mark Antony actually marrying what is the sister of Octavian. Her name was Octavia. Uh, and so uh, their children's kind of important later because um, a lot of the early, a lot of the early Roman emperors, like especially of the uh, Julio Claudian dynasty, are related back through Mark Antony and Octavia. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah, so uh, that's interesting about that. But um, so I think Octavia never had any sons either, like any you know biological ones that survived. But um, now, of course, the other thing that, you know, caused everything to kind of, you know, fall apart, you know, that two together, that little dual dictatorship, it's, of course, you've got Cleopatra again, of course, comes into the picture again. Uh, they think she's part of the reason why that alliance collapsed, because if you know about it, Mark Antony and Cleopatra had this affair, you know, I think they kind of already had an affair before that. They kind of had known each other before that. They've been lovers uh, and uh, apparently Cleopatra, who was concerned about her kingdom, uh, is the one that they think really was behind the affair. The two fell in love, you know, uh, and they later married. Uh, they had three children together. And um, anyway, it's considered one of the greatest love affairs, you know, in, in ancient times. Uh, they've made a lot of movies about it. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, also, there's another story which is true about this. I did want to mention Octavian wasn't just threatened by the fact that, you know, Antony and Cleopatra allied, you know, with each other at that point after that. Uh, he also had this deal where Octavian was worried about Julius Caesar's son, 
uh, that he had, uh, which was um, uh, Caesarian. I told you about earlier. Yes, Caesarian. Uh, and um, who also was given the title Ptolemy the 15th. Uh, and so that's kind of, kind of a, you know, kind of a problem. Uh, so maybe maybe Octavian's thinking that he he could be the ruler that could replace him, you know, like if he died. Uh, and so um, he would try to eliminate him too. Uh, also as well, I think later that Octavian would say some remark like, that's just one too many Caesars. You know, I got to get rid of him uh, also as well. So uh, it ends up causing a civil war to break out, which it's got all kinds of names that they call it. I think Antony's civil war was a, common name they usually called it, which was mostly around about a year or two from 32 to 30 BC. And it's like Octavian, like with the Senate, they're aligned together uh, against Mark Antony and Cleopatra. So you get this two, you know, opposed to each other. It is considered the last major conflict really of the whole Roman Republic, uh, before I guess the empire comes in. Uh, they also call it the last war of the Roman Republic or the final war the Roman Republic. It's got all kinds of names. Uh, they usually call it. And Octavian's forces were led by this general named Marcus Agrippa. He was like really good, a really good general. Uh, and uh, he led his forces uh, in, in, in like an invasion into Greece. Uh, and uh, it, it peaked with the Battle of Actium, which you can see happened in September of 31 BC. And um, it was a naval battle uh, off the western coast of Greece. And um, um, Cleopatra's and uh, Mark Antony's uh, naval force were, were just clobbered. Like, I think they lost over 2,500 ships or more, mostly galley ships. And um, it led to basically uh, Octavian's forces under Marcus Agrippa eventually invading uh, Egypt. Uh, and eventually it's going to force Antony and Cleopatra to, to basically kill themselves. Uh, if you know about the story about this, uh, Antony... Uh, hearing that, you know, he's probably going to get captured, decides to kill himself. And so he takes his sword and runs himself through. Uh, he already doesn't die, if you know about this. And he's brought to Cleopatra. Uh, and um, I think because he also heard a rumor that she was dead, that she'd killed herself. That's why he killed himself, too. And um, I think he died in her arms. Uh, and, of course, Cleopatra is captured, I think, in 31 B.C., uh, and, of course, the story goes is that she later committed suicide via like a poisonous snake, which there's kind of a debate about that, about whether that really happened or not. Uh, but I think the Greek writer Plutarch is the main source on that, on whether she really killed herself that way or not. So I think some people think also the other theory was that Octavian had her killed, because also it could have happened uh, as well. And Octavian later killed also Caesarian, too, had him killed uh, as well. So that basically, that's, you know, what, you know, with the death of Anthony and Cleopatra, you know, what ends up happening, Octavian emerges as the sole ruler of the whole Roman state. He pretty much takes it over uh, after that. Uh, and so he's going to reign for over 40 years uh, after that as the first Roman emperor. And, of course, you'll see later he starts being called another name. Uh, historians start using a lot, you know, which is Augustus, uh, as they call him. And, uh, and I'll kind of explain a little bit later about that, but it's basically, it's a, more like a title that he's, they start using, uh, that the Senate gives him, like, like an honorific title is basically what it is. But you can see he's got all kinds of names. You know, they called him, you know, Octavius or Octavianus, I think was his original name, uh, they called him. Uh, and then he got, you know, when he got adopted by Julius Caesar, they started calling him Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus or something like that. You know, but they call him Octavian for short. I think people still called him that, but you know his title was you know Augustus pretty much uh, after that. So next gonna get into uh, I'm gonna of course move on to talk about the rise of the Roman Empire. So we're gonna get into that uh, and discuss you know the, at least the early part of the Roman Empire, you know at least up to like the first century I'll get into today uh, and then later in the week, uh, on probably when, uh, like a Wednesday, I'll kind of also talk more into the later part of the, of the Roman Empire. And um, so, yeah, you got the so you got like the reign of Augustus. They're talking about like 27 BC. I think they said 44 years. I know in the video, but usually officially the uh, actual 
I guess, reign of Augustus, 27 BC to 14 CE. That's usually the dates of it, which is 40, 41 years, roughly. Uh, he is the longest reigning ruler, by the way, uh, in the Roman Empire, like the emperors. Uh, and um, I think after that, that little, <laughs> the closest guy is like Tiberius of 23. To give you an idea of how long he was in power. Uh, you can see the empires around for over 500 years, uh, 27 BC uh, to 476. Uh, I'll use the dates of the Roman Empire. You can see kind of a picture of the Colosseum right there on the left uh, on that image, and uh, which was not built till later uh, under the Flavian dynasty, which I'll talk about probably on likely Wednesday. But um, he's got different titles. That's the one thing about, like I said, Augustus, who, like I said, comes to power. Uh, at that point, uh, Augustus, um, there's a picture of him right here. Well, that's probably his most famous statue I think they've ever probably found of Augustus right there. But um, he had different titles. Augustus, like I said, was this honorific title that they gave him, which there's all kinds of translations of what the name Augustus means. I think one translation I know is it means the venerable. <clears throat> I think that's usually a good one I know. Uh, or um, the illustrious one or the great one, I think would be another title, uh, translation of it from Latin. Uh, and it's more of a regal title, you know, they gave him. Um, <clears throat> but I think he hated it. You know, he didn't really like Augustus, by the way. Uh, and uh, he preferred this other title uh, that they also gave him, which was princeps or princeps Civitus, uh, which meant uh, first citizen, uh, and, um, and so that's the one that, you know, that they always talk about, uh, that a lot of the emperors are called later, uh, because like the early Roman period, they talk about the principate. And you've heard about that, the principate, but the principate is like a period of the Roman, early Roman empire from 27 BC up to about 284 CE, uh, about 300 years or so, where all the emperors go by the title princeps. Uh, but later, you know, a lot of the emperors are not called that. Uh, if you know about it, there are a lot of the people called Caesars. Uh, it's the name uh, from Judas Caesar's family and all that. And so that's the actual title they call him. So that's the that's the more common name uh, they, they they called him in those days. Like in the Bible, like in the New Testament, they, still, they use that term, right? And they're talking about emperors. Caesar did this, Caesar did this. You know, and so on. I mean, which one? Though? That's the only thing, of course, about that. But um so yeah, like I said, all the different Roman emperors will go by that title. And they do have another title later uh, that's also popular, which is Dominus. You may have heard of that title, Dominus, uh, which means uh, lord or master. They have the so-called dominate of the empire, which 284 up to like 476 CE, down at the collapse of the empire later. Uh, a little bit about like the history, like kind of going into first for get more in Augustus. But um, yeah, they had different historians that wrote about Augustus, like era, and, like a lot of the early emperors. Like these are considered like the first great Roman historians that really write about about the Roman Empire. Uh, the first one you see there is Tacitus. Tacitus is considered to be the greatest Roman historian uh, that they ever had. He's like... Um, I guess the great, like kind of like Aratus or Thucydides, I guess, Thucydides or Plutarch, you know, the Greeks and all that, that they had. So he had him, uh, he had a series of books that were called the 12 Caesars. I'll put that on the screen for you, but um, which were maybe finished about 121 CE, more down into like the period of the five good emperors, which is a little later uh, period in Roman history. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so he had, yeah, so I'm sorry, not that, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one there. Tacitus had the annals of Rome, excuse me, and the histories of Rome were the main ones he had, which were mostly about the end of the Roman Republic and the um, uh, beginning of the empire, especially first century. He also has this book or biography on the life of Agricola, who was a um, Roman general and governor of Britain. Uh, and uh, he's the one who helped conquer most of Britain under them. Oh, and then Suetonius, excuse me, uh, Suetonius, uh, who was like, I think at one point, like a senator maybe, um, and also you can see a chief librarian in Rome um, was very famous as well as a writer. And uh, he had the so-called 12 Caesars, uh, which is kind of like a series of biographies about the period of Julius Caesar, I think, talking about him. And it covers all the way up to like the 
I think up to, up to uh, Emperor Domitian. So he covers like through the Julio-Claudian dynasty, uh, the um, uh, Flavian dynasty, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and then you have also Cassius Dio or Dio Cassius. I think it's usually written either way. It was another one who had also a series of books called the Romanist History, which was written a little later, like in the early third century. It's not as well known. I think he has a lot of good stuff on Augustus, though. Cassius Dio, uh, believe it or not. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of like some of these historians that were big, but supposedly Tacitus, you know, who wrote the annals and histories of Rome and all that, uh, was considered one of the best, you know, Roman historians and all that for that time period anyway. Now they do have this period in Rome uh, that I did want to talk about. There was actually two periods ahead, which one, of course, they had the so-called Age of Augustus, which the video did mention about. Well, they're kind of going into that. Uh, it's a nickname, by the way, uh, for what they call the um, Golden Age of Rome, which really starts, uh, you know, when Augustus comes into power uh, at that point. Uh, and um, it's basically a reign of like something like 40, 41 years that he's in power. Uh, and... Um, Anyway, uh, he's in, yeah, 27 BC to 14 CE, and uh, it, it was considered a golden age because of the fact that basically you had a period where uh, the Roman Empire began to flourish. Uh, you have a lot of great artwork, you know, being created uh, at that time, uh, and, uh, and of course you had all these historians. They talked about all the different historians that, of course, uh, you know, uh, wrote wrote various works at that time, and. Um, Anyway, um, so I got kind of named after him, Age of Augustus. Uh, and uh, also, you know, a lot of the structure of the Roman Empire, like you get all the different, you know, one thing about uh, Augustus, he began to kind of, you know, construct a lot of roads to the city, aqueducts. Uh, also, he developed a lot of the civil service system they had. They talked about the little video. So there's a lot of things that Augustus did to kind of, you know, begin what would be later the, the Roman Empire. So a lot of people kind of view Augustus as kind of like being the father of the Roman Empire. He's kind of like kind of like maybe George Washington to us, you know, compared to what would be for them, uh, for the guy that started everything for them. Uh, there is also the so-called uh, Pax Romana. That's another thing, of course, that he's kind of known for starting so-called Arab Roman peace, which uh, goes from 27 BC to 180 CE. Uh, that's really, really well known. Uh, that's like the beginning of the age of Augustus, really, like when it starts being, you know, the Roman Empire starts flourishing. And it does cover up all the way through like multiple dynasties. Like you got the Julio-Claudian dynasty, the beginning of it, uh, the Flavian dynasty, uh, the period of the five good emperors. I think those are the three main periods you have really uh, in Roman history. And it's when the Roman Empire, by the way, peaked, like in size, uh, in power, uh, and um, it's considered one of the most peaceful periods in Roman history. There's like very few wars that were fought uh, throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, and um, after that, of course, it started going downhill. So that's that's one thing they always talk about, Augustus, you know, is the so-called Pax Romana that he was starting. It would eventually end around 180 when Commodus would come to power after Marcus Aurelius died. So we'll get to that later, probably later in the week. Talk about that. Oh, also about, uh, yeah, besides doing all that construction, of course, I talked about, but Praetorian Guard, I think that, well, I don't know if they talked about that in the that little short video on Augustus, but that was something he did develop too, uh, which was the so-called Imperial Guard of the Roman emperors, which was about the size of a Roman legion. Uh, probably have like four, five thousand troops mostly at the most, and uh, they're kind of instrumental in you know guarding the the, the emperor and his family, uh, and they think the Praetorian Guard was something that Octavian or Augustus developed uh, mostly because of the fact that his uncle got assassinated, so he's kind of concerned about you know being killed himself, uh, and so that's why it was developed. Uh, Augustus also developed the first dynasty, of course, in Roman history. Uh, with the Roman Empire, which was the so-called Julio-Claudian dynasty uh, that would come in uh, pretty much with his reign and after his death, 
Uh, and yeah, it's the first of several of these imperial dynasties uh, that come to power, which I've got a picture of right here. I'll show you. Uh, and uh, it's got five in it. Of course, five rulers are part of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. You've got Augustus, of course, the founder of it initially. Uh, you've got Tiberius uh, also as well. Caligula, uh, Claudius, usually called Claudius the first, and then also Nero uh, as well. Here, of course, a list of them right here. And you can see a little bit about them, by the way, all of them, if you want to how they're related and all that. But Tiberius was the son-in-law, by the way, Augustus. Augustus didn't have any sons, by the way, survived biologically. Uh, so he, had, he, of course, adopted him later, Tiberius. He was, by the way, a general. We'll get to that later. Caligulus was uh, Tiberius' nephew uh, who came to power after that. Claudius I, or Claudius, uh, was the Caligula's uncle. Uh, and then Nero was supposedly Cal Cal Claudius's grandnephew. Uh, back, Caligula was actually, I think I'll get to it later, he was actually the great-grandson of um, Emperor Augustus, uh, which is true, of course, uh, about that. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I'll kind of get into a little bit about them, kind of go into like the Julio-Claudian dynasty, a little bit about each of the emperors and kind of what they're kind of known for, uh, more or less. Uh, well, the emperor that would follow next was, like I said, Tiberius. Uh, Tiberius, by the way, uh, was not very popular, like compared to really, um, <clears throat> really, you know, compared to, you know, Augustus, who everybody, I guess, liked. Uh, he was just, you know, hated. Uh, and um, well, what about him? Uh, Tiberius uh, was actually the second longest reigning emperor in Roman history, like 23 years. Uh, he was in power. Uh, he was like this Roman general uh, under under uh, Jewish, under uh, Augustus, who um, he had this brother he had that was, I think, more popular named Germanicus. And um, I think there was a talk of either, I think he adopted both of them, I thought, at one point. And I think Germanicus was, I think, was one that was supposed to be the one that I think that could have been emperor. Uh, but he died, maybe poisoned, they're not sure. Uh, and so Tiberius ended up being, you know, the, the uh, emperor. And he ended up marrying one of Augustus' daughters. <clears throat> so he came like his son-in-law. And so that's how he came to power, uh, Tiberius. But like I said, he wasn't very popular. Uh, and um, Tiberius was kind of a tyrant. Uh, he was uh, known for a lot of political repression uh, under him. And he had this um, head of the Praetorian Guard named Macro. You see there, who kind of <clears throat> reigned over the state for like some like six, seven years. <clears throat> and um, anyway, Macro started this reign of terror where they started putting people on trial uh, for uh, <clears throat> for treason or, or any, I guess anybody they felt like it was an enemy of the state had them eliminated. Uh, and so, um, and Tiberius is kind of a weird guy. Uh, he, um, I don't know if you know much about him. He was uh, he kind of shows right here in this little slide here. But one point for about, I want to say, looks like 10 or 11 years, he reigned from this uh, island off the coast of Italy. They call it the Isle of Capri. Uh, and uh, anyway, like in, I think in Louisiana, they got a couple casinos named after that. That was when they were Lake Charles called the Isle of Capri or something like that, what they've got. And uh, it's kind of funny. But anyway, um, He's kind of a recluse, and uh, but he's <clears throat> known for like um, he was kind of bisexual. And uh, one thing about Tiberius, he liked boys a lot, like sex with boys. Like I think they talk about that or something. I think it was a Suetonius or one of those writers kind of mentions about that story. And uh, they think it might have corrupted Caligula's mind because Caligula lived with him and all that on the island and saw his kind of crazy stuff, uh, and so. Anyway, uh, what happened was they believed that Tiberius um, either died of natural causes uh, in 37 CE. It's actually been a claim that Caligula may have had him murdered, like poison. Not sure, or so, I, I think maybe even smothered to death. I think there's kind of a debate about that. I'm not sure I believe that. But I think I know he was pretty old when he died, uh, Tiberius. So, um, so yeah, Tiberius would die. Uh, and so... I'll get to it later, but under Tiberius, you know, you get the rise of Christianity starts. Like under Tiberius is when they think Jesus of Nazareth was put to death, like in Israel. It's around the same time period we're talking about. Uh, well, that's connected with what Macro was doing and all that in Rome. I don't know, because they had all these treason trials that were kind of going on in 
Jesus was put on trial, you know, for, for blasphemy or whatever it was, heresy. Uh, and so it's kind of like, you know, kind of similar to that. But yeah, Caligula would come in next. Uh, Caligula was kind of uh, crazy, uh, considered one of the most crazy of the emperors, of course, in Rome. Him and I think Nero. Commodus was pretty crazy, too, also as well. <clears throat> and uh, Caligula, by the way, was known as Little Boots. <laughs> and uh, his real name was actually Gaius Julius Caesar. He was, like I said, the great-grandson of Augustus. And um, how did he get the name Little Boots, which is what Caligula meant? Uh, basically, he, um, like I said, had been, um, he was actually the son of Germanicus, who was a Roman general. And uh, we fought like in mostly Roman Britain, I think it was. And uh, anyway, um, I think he fought in Britain and also fought in Germany, both those areas, I believe. Yeah, that's about the, no, yeah, that's about the time period, I think it was. Mostly Germany, though. But um, anyway, um, his uh, I think his mother, I think, was the one who used to dress him up as a little Roman legionnaire. Uh, and so a lot of the troops called him Caligula, which meant either little boot or little boots. Because uh, the the Caliga, I think if you know about that, the, the Caliga is like what they call the Roman boot sandal that the, that the Roman soldiers would wear. And so people would call that nickname later. Uh, Harry he hated it, by the way. He didn't like being called Caligula. Not sure if you could call that to his name. Uh, and um, he also didn't like um, people like mentioning um, about the fact that he had this really bad bald spot on the top of his head. <laughs> he had a bad receding line or something like that, hairline. And uh, so if you mention anything about that or, or about a goat, or, you know, that goats have like a bald spot on their head. He would have you killed. <laughs> he was insane, uh, Caligula. Although it didn't start out that way. I think the first six months he came into power, um, things were normal, you know. But then they, what happened was he came down with some awful illness, which they're not sure what it was. I think there's been some theories that he may have suffered from encephalitis, which was like a swelling of the brain, and it caused him to go mad. Uh, and so he was known for a lot of uh, sadistic, tendencies, you know, uh, a Caligula. And um, there's a lot of stories about it that circulate. There's that one about his racehorse they always tell about, which is kind of funny, uh, how uh, he had this racehorse named Incentitus uh, that he would, I think, use in uh, chariot races. And um, apparently uh, was angry about the fact that there was no good person that could be, they thought, Roman consul that he could appoint. Uh, and so he said that he threatened to make his horse consul instead. I think he also would give lavish banquets for it and stuff like that, uh, Caligula. Uh, there's a story about his, uh, suppose he had an affair with his sister named Drusilla. I don't know if that's true or not either, but he suppose he loved her. They had some kind of affair. And I think when he died, he kind of was really, you know, sad about it and all that. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy stories about Caligula. Uh, he practically like burn their whole treasury. Like I think, I think under going back to Augustus and Tiberius, uh, they had like a surplus and he just spent all the money uh, lavishly and so on. So he's actually killed though. The Praetorian guard uh, in 41 CE murdered him. He killed him and his whole family. Uh, and so um, Caligula was considered probably to be the first, first real emperor to be assassinated because that's something that Rome is kind of known for. Like a lot of Roman emperors were assassinated. That's something that's well known uh, today. I'll kind of talk about some of those later they have, but it, it's one of the first ones, of course, that occurred. And they killed his wife, and I think they killed all his kids because they didn't want any of them to maybe try to take power later, you know, and all that. So that brings in, of course, uh, number four that they have, of course, which is Claudius. Claudius, who, by the way, was, like I said, the uncle of Caligula. Uh, who reigns from 50, 41 to 54 BC, uh, by the way, considered to be, by the way, the second best Julio Claudian ever. I don't know they had too many good ones. Oh, they only had two good ones, I guess. They had really, I thought, <laughs> which was Claudius and probably Augustus uh, overall. And uh, there's been paintings made of this before. By the way, I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but there's one where, like, uh, there's one right here where uh, supposedly Claudius is begging for his life uh, and uh they think what happened was after uh, 
Caligula was killed, uh, the Praetorian Guard basically dragged Claudius out behind this like balcony where he was hiding behind a curtain. And he's like, oh, God, they're going to kill me, too. You know, he thought, you know, basically. And then as they're begging for him, they go, oh, you're the emperor next. <laughs> so, so that kind of shows you, you know, how powerful the Praetorian Guard was about the fact that they could decide, you know, who the next emperor might be. And uh, quite often, you know, who chose the next emperor was really the military, not like the Senate or anything like that. In fact, very few times the Roman Senate actually decided who the emperor would be, it would usually be the military. And it's not necessarily because of had a, had a hereditary means uh, that someone would get, you know, you know, the title of emperor, uh, et cetera, like you see later, like in Europe or whatever. So, yeah, Claudius, a little bit about him. Uh, Claudius was from a family called the Claudian. He's kind of like from this family called the Claudian family. I think he kind of intermarried, I think, with them. Uh, and um, I think him and Tiberius, I think, were kind of related back to each other somehow. But uh, but he, he basically was one of the first emperors that was born outside of Italy. Uh, he was actually from Gaul, where he was born. I think that's part of what um, kind of, I think he was one of the first to start giving people uh, Roman citizenship outside of Rome, uh, outside of Italy, especially. Uh, something you'll kind of see uh, with that. And um, I think the most famous thing that happened under him, which I'll kind of talk more about later, uh, is that the Romans actually invade Britain at that time. Yeah, they actually do. Uh, and uh, so Roman Britain is invaded. I think I want to say around, I think it's, I want to say for uh, what year it was exactly, but I think it was, that's, those dates are wrong, by the way. That should be 41 to, um, I, think I, I got the dates wrong here for you, but that should have been uh, 40, 41 to 54 CE, I think is the actual dates, not BC. But um, I think I want to say 47 or 48, it's around 48 uh, CE is about when the Romans would begin invading Britain. It would take them something like 40 years to actually conquer it. So it's going to be a while uh, for that. Or actually, I think it's under the Flavian dynasty when they finally conquer most of it up to like southern Scotland. Uh, Claudius, um, like I said, was a pretty good emperor, uh, like I said, but uh, he was notorious for like being married multiple times, which a lot of the Romans did. Uh, the Romans practiced monogamy, but they divorced a lot like the Greeks did uh, as well. And uh, his family's fourth wife had him murdered, they think, <laughs> believe it or not. Agrippina the Younger, they called her, Agrippina Minor. Uh, and uh, she wanted to put her own son on the throne, by the way, uh, basically. And so uh, I think Claudius had his own son who he had, who I think was named Britannica or something like that. Uh, and so uh, he had these two sons he had now that could have been Emperor Nero and his own son. Uh, however, what happened later, they think, at least they theorize what they think happened. There's kind of a debate about this, whether that happened or not. They think that Nero uh, was able to seize power because of his mother, uh, who had Claudius poison. At least that's the main theory, but there's kind of a debate about that, whether that really happened or not. But so, yes, Nero comes in. Uh, Nero, you know, uh, is considered to be one of the youngest emperors uh, so far at that point. He's only 16 years old, by the way, when Nero comes to power. Uh, I don't know if you know much about Nero, but Nero is considered to be one of the most unpopular emperors uh, in Roman history. Uh, he reigned, by the way, about 14 years, 54 to 68 CE. So all the way, the last of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. You know, they only had five emperors. By the way, none of the emperors after him would be even related somehow to any of the, you know, previous rulers going back to Julius Caesar or Augustus. And um, he was known for being tyrannical, kind of like Caligula and Tiberius, mad, full of debauchery is right, for sure. Uh, and uh, Nero is notorious for all kinds of crazy antics. Um, there's all kinds of stories they tell about him uh, where um, there was one story I know where he liked to get drunk. He would disguise himself. He would visit the drop, uh, brothels like in, in Rome. I think it was a story where he used to go and mug people on the streets <laughs> like a bandit. It's kind of weird. He was also bisexual. He actually married two men and he had three wives. He killed his first two wives, killed them both. I think he buried his third wife. Um, and then he killed his mother. 
<laughs> had his mother killed uh, as well, which was in the year 59, I think in the fifth year of his reign, had her murdered. Uh, and um, he also was an artist. He was, I don't know if you know, he's a great artist, he thought. You know, he would sing the Lear and uh, force people to watch him play. Uh, so the guy was really a maniac, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you know about, uh, you know, Nero, he's notorious for uh, the so-called Great Fire of Rome uh, that occurred, which happened in the year 64. Uh, and um, he, of course, was later blamed for it. Uh, it was considered, you know, one of the worst, you know, catastrophes to hit ancient ancient Roman city. It destroyed a lot of the old Roman city, you know, going back to Augustus and before. And it burned, you can see, a good chunk of it, like at least three-fourths of Rome burned at one point. Uh, and they think it was an accident. They really do. And although I, if you know about it, they believe he was blamed for it, uh, which I'll kind of explain later about that. Uh, but um, I think they say it started in the Circus Maximus and spread to the rest of the city. Uh, and it would end up killing hundreds of people. And um, it, it created a lot of homeless people, <clears throat> which is true. Uh, and um, the reason why he got blamed for it, I'll kind of show this picture here right here, but he started building this lavish palace, <clears throat> which I think a lot of people called it later the <clears throat> so-called golden house. It was called because it had this golden dome on it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they, it was like in a slum area of the city of Rome. And so people started thinking that maybe he was behind it. Uh, and I think there's even a case where some of the Roman historians actually thought that Nero did do it. You know, what was the two that thought? I thought there were two that thought he did it, uh, which was, um, yeah, I think Suetonius uh, and Cassius Dio thought he actually did it. Like he may have burned the city or been behind. Although Tacitus, who's the more well-known of the historians, uh, says he did not, that he wasn't even in Rome uh, when it happened. But as you know, you've heard the story where they, they talk about the fact that he uh, played the Lear and sang the sack of Rome as Rome burned and didn't do anything about it. Uh, and so that, that really made people mad, you know, about him. And I think people were also not happy about the fact that he was just, like I said, unpopular and tyrannical uh, as well. So, um, so what happened, if you know what occurred, was he blamed, I didn't do it, <laughs> he blamed the Christians for it. So the Christians, you know, end up getting blamed for it, uh, as you know. Uh, and so um, he becomes like this first Roman emperor that really openly begins to persecute, uh, you know, this new religious sect that's kind of starting to take off uh, in Rome. Uh, and you even get like, there's even like some Roman historians, like, you know, from Latin sources, like you see Tacitus, Suetonius, they're really the first ones that really start to, you know, discuss that there's these Christians that, that exist and uh, how they're persecuted. And uh, some were all, the way they killed them was awful. Like they had cases where they would um, crucify them uh, and set them on fire. You know, there's stories where they talk about how Nero would have these lavish parties uh, and he would use them for light. They'll light up the parties, just burn them and burn them. Uh, I guess at the stake, uh, and uh, there's also I think they tell stories where they would um, uh, wrap them in animal skins or something weird, and then throw them to wild animals to be torn apart. So pretty awful. Uh, and uh, so yeah, Nero's the first to really openly persecute the Christians, and so from the next couple centuries or so, the Christians end up getting persecuted uh, and all of that. And that's one thing I did want to talk about also today, just a few minutes today. Uh, and just kind of get into it because I am going to be talking more about, you know, the rise of Christianity later because, uh, yeah, that's something that does happen in the Roman Empire from the first, really from the first century up through all the way to like the fourth century. you got this period where, you know, you got the Roman, this new Roman religion that emerges uh, overall. But um, I'll get to Nero later, but Nero, Nero's uh, whole reign collapses. It falls apart, uh, and um, civil war breaks out among his generals, and he'll eventually kill himself is one of the things that happens. But I'll kind of talk about that later because uh, that's going to lead into the so-called uh, Flavian dynasty that, that comes in and takes over. Uh, I'll, call, I'll talk about Emperor Vespasian, who probably is the most famous one who built the Colosseum, Roman Colosseum, of course, in Rome. 
Now, yeah, Christianity itself began, by the way, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire area. Now, you know, part of what is Judea, I think they called it, also an area which is also called Galilee. It's actually two areas that are there. And if you know about it, the, uh, you know, the base of Christianity is, you know, based on Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, they called him uh, also, uh, who a lot of Christians believe was the son of God, you know, the Messiah uh, in, in that they talk about in the Old Testament, uh, who um, supposedly was born in Bethlehem and Judea, uh, in, uh, but actually was from northern Israel, uh, where it would be now called Nazareth, which they think was some kind of some kind of village that was there, which they don't know where it is. I don't think they ever found it, believe it or not. At least the original Nazareth. Uh, and anyway, uh, most of our sources on Jesus come from, you know, the New Testament. I think the two biggest books that are important in the New Testament is the book of, you know, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Those two books uh, that are there, they give us more of our information on the early life of Jesus, like his virgin birth, uh, Bethlehem with, you know, Mary and Joseph. Uh, also, he caught, kind of go into like, his baptism under John the Baptist, uh, his trade as a carpenter. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. I don't know if you know that or not. And they also go into his public ministry, which uh, they think uh, started, started sometime in his early 30s, like maybe, I think 30 CE or something like that seems to be the popular date. It's been a debate about when he was born. You know, that's, that's, I think, I think it says six to four B. Well, I think it's six AD or six, no, six BC, I think is what it is, or four. I forget what the dates are. It's like a 10 year period, I know they talk about, which is now kind of put at 180 or 1 CE, but they're not sure when he was born. That's kind of a debate about the date on. I think it's 10 years off about when it is. It says six to four BC, but I think they're talking about four BC, maybe up to six AD. Maybe be what it is. But um, uh, yeah, of course, this ministry, like I said, was very short. Uh, they think it happened, they believe, under the reign of Tiberius. That's about when it was. Uh, and uh, at the time, they had this prefect that ran Judea, which was a Roman province, the eastern part of the Roman Empire, which was run by Pontius Pilate. And the Pontius Pilate, they think, was a real person, by the way, because he was mentioned by other sources, not just in the Bible, but if you heard Flavius Josephus, I've talked about before. Josephus, Josephus mentions, you know, Pontius Pilate. It's got a lot of historic, historical information about him. But like I said, I did my dissertation on was Josephus, by the way. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, uh, if you know about it, Jesus was arrested. This is right after the Last Supper. He was accused of heresy, like blasphemy, because of the fact that he was, kind of claimed himself to be the son of God. Uh, he thought he was the next King David. You know, basically, that would they thought would save the you know the Jews from you know the the Romans and all that, and so he was arrested, uh, and uh, he was eventually put on trial. Which they kind of, if you know about the read the Bible, they kind of go back and forth between the Jewish and Roman authorities, and they couldn't decide you know who should charge him and all that. Uh, and eventually, Pontius Pilate, uh, as you know, would decide Jesus' fate uh, and have him crucified, uh, which. They think happened in the year 33 CE, but that's, like I said, the years debated about when it was. They do think he was crucified sometime around what would be when Easter is, which would be like where they have Easter and Passover sometime in the spring. has been theorized. Uh, now, after his, uh, before he, you know, Jesus resurrects and you know, is executed and all that, um, one of the, the big things that happens with Jesus uh, as opposed to you have the so-called um, Great Commission uh, that occurs. I don't even heard about that. Uh, but right before Jesus is crucified, um, his, he meets with his disciples to, to basically tell them to spread his you know, message uh, to you know, the, the Roman world, you know, his gospel. Uh, and so that's, that's something that you know, starts the so-called, uh, they call it the Apostolic Age, which will follow later, where the, all the apostles will start spreading Christianity uh, throughout the first century. And it'll spread eventually, you know, throughout most of that period. And they, they, usually the apostolic age is usually from about 33 to about 100 uh, CE, because they think they think John, one of the last apostles, died around 100, 100 CE. Well, that's debate about when it was, but that's about when, it, when they think it may, be, it may have been. 
Um, of course, the um, there's not of course slider with the apostles. Of course, I'll get to Paul later, uh, who was considered you know one of you know Jesus, I guess more famous apostles later, but he didn't really know Jesus by the way. Uh, but um, what happens is you know you have all these so-called twelve apostles that they have, I and mean, they're they're kind of part of you know like I said, spreading you know Christianity. Uh, these are some of the famous ones, of course, that actually all knew Jesus. Those are the ones that are the big ones that they always talk about, uh, which there's like 12 of them, you know, uh, that they originally had. Uh, but um, St. John the Baptist, of course, you see there's one of them right there. I'll get to you later. But St. Peter, um, of course, also known as Simon Peter, uh, was considered really one of the most important ones of uh, the different uh, apostles, uh, really the closest leader uh, besides Jesus, uh, and um, he was considered, you know, Jesus' rock, uh, the one that would be later considered to be the first um, bishop of Rome, or, or what the Catholic Church now calls the first pope, uh, and all that. And uh, so he's pretty important as well. St. John the Baptist, who I just mentioned, uh, of course, was another one uh, as well. Uh, St. John the Baptist uh, is important because he wrote a lot of some of the books in the uh, New Testament, like the, the Gospel of John is attributed to him, uh, the Epistles of John, uh, the Book of Revelation uh, may have been written also by him as well. Uh, St. James the Greater, uh, who was, by the way, a brother of John, St. John uh, the Baptist. Um, he, of course, is, is also as the son of Zebedee. Uh, he's also important uh, as well. Uh, St. James is known for different things. Uh, he was mostly known for uh, spreading the gospel of Jesus, especially to the western part of the empire, as far as Spain at one point. Uh, and then also, of course, St. James the Lesser was another one that was also famous as well. Matthew was another one. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Simon, Thomas, Thaddeus. Of course, Judas, you've heard of him. Uh, his carryout, of course, was... Uh, also, the one that portrayed Jesus, remember at the Last Supper uh, and all that. So, yeah, those are all those, of course, that were famous uh, that they had. Uh, they also had St. Paul, you know, St. Paul of Tarsus as well, uh, of course, uh, who actually did not really know Jesus, at least during his lifetime. Uh, he actually, St. Paul, they think, was from Turkey, uh, a place called Tarsus. And uh, anyway, um, he actually would end up converting to uh, Christianity. He was actually this um, Hellenized Jew uh, that had this mass conversion, uh, and he would in end up being one of the most influential. Uh, he would actually spread Christianity all throughout uh, the you know the Roman Empire, uh, and mostly because of the fact that he was a, a Roman Roman citizen, uh, and he's called the Apostle of the Gentiles. And you know Saint Paul is later known for writing a lot of letters or epistles to various churches, trying to create, you know, Christian churches like in Turkey and Syria, et cetera. And so in the end, he's like considered one of the most famous, you know, that they have um, in the first century anyway. Uh, later, they have the so-called gospel accounts, you know, the so-called, you know, stories that, that told about Jesus' life and all that, his ministry. They kind of aided in trying to, you know, spread the ideals of Christianity uh, throughout the Roman world. Uh, the term gospel just means good news in Greek. There are numerous of these stories. They think they were originally oral. Uh, they were kind of passed down. Uh, and then they think sometime in the late part of the four, uh, first century, they began to be written down, eventually in Greek. And those are the four that the later church, you know, the, Christ, the, the, the Christian church under the Roman Empire later, uh, will eventually canonize, which were Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. Uh, but they do think that there were, you know, other, you know, you know, gospels at one point. There's a lot of these ones that are apocrypha, you know, that they don't, they don't, you know, canonize, et cetera. And so they think those might be the closest, but they're not the original sources. The original sources, the gospels, of course, uh, don't, don't exist anymore. And they think that the current gospels are, might be a second or third hand account, believe it or not. And they think they're original sources too. I won't get into that, but there, I think there's like one called Q they talk about sometimes that was maybe an original source that went back before that. 
Uh, now, over time, the, Christ, the Christian movement was split. And they don't stay together. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, but like in the first century, you start getting a split in the Christian movement. And you got Jewish Christians and you got those that are more Roman Christians uh, that are more like related to the pagans. Uh, and so uh, the original Christians like Jesus and his followers were all Jews. Uh, they were like based in Israel or Turkey or something like that. And um, and then you got all these converts that come in later uh, that start, you know, you know, start, you know, adopting the religion. And uh, you kind of break them down in different groups. Like they have these two groups here. They had one group that was called the Nazarenes that they had. The Nazarenes were the original followers of Jesus because uh, it kind of came from the term Nazareth originally. They include like Jesus and his brother, James the Just, you may have heard of, uh, who was an early religious leader after Jesus died. Uh, and then you have the Ebionites, which means poor ones in Greek. Uh, and uh, they were kind of this group that kind of broke off from the Nazarenes. And uh, they kind of practiced this uh, way of life that was impoverished. They thought that if they lived an impoverished lifestyle, that was a key to salvation, well, et cetera. Uh, and then you have the Roman Christians, you know, you, you, the ones that are like Gentiles, the ones that relate to like pagans, basically converted. And uh, they were kind of influenced by St. Paul and St. Peter a lot. Uh, when the split happened, there's kind of a debate about when Christianity begins to split, but usually they, they start talking about the Council of Jerusalem in 50 CE. That's usually when Christianity really split. Uh, and uh, you get this kind of uh, deal where they have this um, meeting between the different leaders of early Christianity in Israel. And uh, what happened was uh, Paul and Peter met with James the Just, who was the brother of Jesus. In fact, James the Just was the main leader of the Nazarenes in Israel after Jesus died. Uh, and uh, James didn't want to let in the pagans, like th them come in. Uh, he only wanted Jews in the religion. Uh, and so that kind of became kind of a conflict uh, between both sides. Paul, by the way, didn't want to have circumcision, which most Romans didn't like. In fact, Romans thought circumcision was barbaric, you know, cutting off your you know thing, whatever part of it. <laughs> and anyway, um, and then of course, um, Jewish Mosaic law, you know, they wanted, uh, they wanted, they didn't, they didn't want to keep Moses' laws and all that, like all like all of them anyway, like no kosher stuff and things like that. They didn't want to keep that, I guess. The Jews wanted to keep circumcision. They wanted to keep all of you know Moses' laws and so on, things like that. Paul wanted to replace Mosaic law with, with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is what happened uh, later. And so that's kind of considered why there's such a split, you know, uh, between both sides. Uh, then they got the Jewish-Roman wars, which I'll get to later, that break out uh, between the Romans and Jews. In fact, the Romans hated the Jews. They couldn't stand them, even though the Jews all over probably the empire, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, in th they think what happened was it led to the, destruction of the second temple. It was wiped out in 70, B, 70 CE. Uh, and so when that got wiped out, a lot of those Jewish leaders we talked about, like the Nazarenes and I guess the Ebionites movement and all that, that would decline later. And so you get this more Roman style religion that kind of evolves from Christianity instead of the Jewish version of it. Uh, they also had a Jewish tax. That was another thing they talked about too. Uh, under the Flavian dynasty, uh, there was this thing called the, it was called the Fiscus uh, Judicus, and uh, basically the Flavians put taxes on Jews. Uh, and so uh, if you were Jewish, you had to pay all these taxes, but if you were Christian, you didn't. And so a lot of people didn't want to be Jewish. They wanted to be Christian. And so that was part of the other reason why he will start adopting. So I imagine that wouldn't have happened, that people would have been Jewish. I think there's a debate about whether the fact that the Roman Empire could have been Jewish, believe it or not instead of, you know, Christian, possibly. Uh, then by the Middle Ages, of course, you get this deal where you get the, the actual church would split into these two, you know, rival medieval churches. Uh, you see there, Rome and Catholic one, which is based in Rome with the Pope. And you got the Greek Orthodox Church, of course, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, they call it too, uh, in Constantinople with the Patriarch. Uh, and so, all these were basically remnants of the Roman Empire. Uh, in fact, they believe both those churches formed out of the fact that the Roman Empire split. You know about this. You have the Western Roman Empire, right? And you have the Eastern Roman Empire, which they later called Byzantine Empire. 
Uh, and so basically the Orthodox Church was the church of the Byzantine Empire. And then you got the Western Empire, Western Roman Empire, the Catholic Church. But it collapsed in the West. And so medieval Europe became all Catholic after that. So I'll get to that later. But, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about the, you know, the medieval church, you know, et cetera, uh, that existed uh, with Christianity. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, that's pretty much it for today. Uh, I'll kind of continue more into uh, the Roman Empire on Wednesday. I'll kind of go into like the Flavian dynasty that kind of takes power next. Uh, kind of talk about Nero's, his whole reign collapses, of course. So I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the period of five good emperors uh, that occurs. I'll also start talking about how the empire starts falling apart in the third century CE. Uh, and then I should be able to get to even talking about the rise of like uh, Constantine the Great, because uh, Constantine the one is going to put the empire on the footing uh, to uh, basically, um, which will be Christian later. Uh, she's asked me, like Amber's got a question, you have a top five ranking of Roman emperors. Well, obviously Augustus is probably number one. Uh, after that, I don't know. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, he's pretty good. He's up there probably in the top five. Emperor Trajan is pretty good uh, as well. Hadrian is another great uh, emperor I would throw in there also as well. I don't know. After that, it's kind of gets tight. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'd say that, that'd be my four right there. I don't know about the fifth one, though, after that. Maybe uh, I think maybe you could throw in Constantine the Great as well. That might be the fifth one, maybe. I would throw in there too, uh, also as well. So, so anyway, that's a good question there. Uh, but um, so that's it for today. Uh, by the way, don't forget uh, if you have any questions for me, you know, about the lecture, uh, let me know. Uh, like you can just you know leave me a comment, of course, or question on my YouTube channel uh, overall. And uh, don't forget about that. Like I said about that exam, it's going to expire tonight. I did put up, of course, a new assignment for you. Uh, of course, which is on early Roman history, which is part of part one, part two, and part of this lecture, of course, today uh, with the early Roman Empire. So that's it. Um, hope you all have a great week. Uh, but like I said, we only got three weeks left, so pretty much more finals. So y'all take care. I'll see you, of course, later in the week.